Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are so delighted to be back with you. We've thought about our conversation all week and ways in which we can continue this morning. And uh, as always, we deeply appreciate your warm hospitality. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'll begin with a quick review of. Uh, some of the things we did last week, and then we are going to indeed move to a second dilemma, and then perhaps introduce a third as well. We said that our, our interest these two weeks was, first of all, to uh, engage one another simply in exploring the moral implications of the stories that we've gathered over the years and are sharing with you, and then to familiarize ourselves with Jewish sources historically that deal with these issues, and then to reflect on the process of using such sources to stimulate and guide our thinking as we grapple with these questions. What does uh, it matter? if we explore such questions in ever larger circles of conversation, reaching back generations and millennia to experience perspectives that may be far removed from our own circumstances, is that nevertheless perhaps an enriching way to think through the most difficult moral challenges we face? In uh, my introductory comments last week. I told you a little bit about the kinds of sources we're using. We're using, I said on the one hand, sources rooted in biblical law, which came to be referred to uh, in rabbinic literature as halakha, as a way, or perhaps some have said as a way to a point, a way with a goal, as compared to agada, talk. We said that halakhic sources are uh, characterized by their uh, establishing a norm for specific circumstances. You tell me where you are and the question you have about your circumstances, and I will try to formulate a normative response to the question, what do I do? Because specific? It's normative, it's not simply personal, it has to do with expectations that go broadly through the community, and it's uh, oriented towards an action. It results in what I do under such circumstances, whereas agada is much broader. It has to do with ideas, concepts, example stories, narrative, aphorisms, and the like, and he presented a little bit of both. But as I, I said last week, the development of Jewish culture was primarily in terms of halakhic definitions and agadic refining of attitudes. Halakha defines the Jewish life. Agada refines the Jewish life. And in that respect, our primary consideration is focused on the halakhic material we have. As I said very briefly last week, one finds in the earliest layers of Christian sources this distinction, most notably in what sets the Gospel of Matthew apart, and to some degree the letter of James, from much of the rest of New Testament materials. But Matthew is clearly written for Jews in those earliest generations of the church who were still committed to a halakhic life. And their question was now, what is the halakha like for people in this community? You find it quite pronounced in Matthew in particular. And of course, we're familiar with Paul's second thought is on the other hand regarding that way of looking at being a member of God's community. Paul's insistence that ultimately the life of a member of this new community is defined by Haggadah that perhaps in some circumstances requires a normative complement as well. <coughs> Paul attempts to flip this paradigm. In our closing reflections, we're going to 
ask that we perhaps take a moment to think about that distinction and its role in our lives personally and in our communities. We began last week with a dilemma, a story that came to us. It actually is a, a story laced with a problem that we heard firsthand. And uh, you recall it has to do with a couple who find themselves, as they were aptly defined at the close of our conversation last week, as somewhere between the parents of their children and the children of their parents. And the dilemmas that arise under those circumstances, in this case, having to do with where one ultimately makes one's home. Without going through the details of the dilemma one more time, I would, however, like us to look at the source sheet that we began with last week. If you have it, will you? And in particular, quickly look at the sources that we didn't get to. Open uh, ourselves for a little more conversation, and then turn to a new story. You recall that we noted that in the Old Testament and the Bible, there are two primary legal, halakhic, normative statements regarding relationships between children and parents. One is framed in terms of the value concept kavod, the other yir'ah. In the sheet that I provided you, I didn't translate the terms because I wanted to protect us from leaping toward the connotations we usually have for the words that are typically used in English for those two terms, honor and fear or reverence. Instead, we move to the rabbinic sources, Mishnah, Talmud, early Midrash, that attempt to make sense of those terms. And we said in early rabbinic sources, interestingly enough, kavod is uh, associated with its root word uh, base, which has something to do with weight or substance. Rabbinic tradition understands kavod as in honor your mother and father, kabed et avicha ve'et imecha, actually father and mother in that case, mother and father in the line from Leviticus, as support in substantive, material, concrete ways your parents meet their <coughs> daily needs. That's <coughs> kabod. Whereas yirah, <coughs> commonly translated as um, fear or reverence, is understood in early rabbinic sources as not crossing them in such a way as to undermine that kavod. That is, don't publicly embarrass them by taking someone else's side. Don't do those kinds of things that would indicate that you're supplanting them, that you're pushing them aside. But in our conversation, we noted that some words, interestingly enough, that we might commonly associate with this biblical tradition of what one owes a parent don't appear. So who can remind us of the missing words that we noted last week? Love. Love. We're not commanded to love our parents. Or? Like, like. Pardon? Like. Uh, yes. Obey. 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 Yes, absolutely. I want to note, before we look at the last sources on the sheet, that clearly there is adequate material, a godic, that is broad conceptual material, accompanying these rabbinic sources to say, of course, one ought to love one's the, the ideal, the aspirations for the finest, the most tender, the deepest relationship with one's parents. And if for some reason that's disrupted, you still have responsibilities. It may not require a certain emotional orientation, it certainly doesn't lead to total subjugation, but it does matter that one fulfill one's responsibilities towards a parent regardless of the complexities 
of the emotional attachment or distance. Let's just look at the last sources, and then I'd like to ask if there have been any new thoughts about the dilemma since we last met. We were in the medieval materials, and you'll recall that I posed in uh, the third column Maimonides' own background as a physician as the basis for his statement, uh, whatever Kavod and Yirah require, if there's something so troubling, so disoriented, about the relationship at some point, especially a, a parent whose cognitive or emotional state is utterly impossible for a child to engage. One can use an agent to meet one's responsibilities. One must meet those responsibilities, but if you can't do it personally, then you find someone who can do it on your behalf. To which Abraham ibn Daoud, a contemporary of Maimonides, an almost comparably well-known Jewish thinker of the 12th century and leading halakhic authority, says in a commentary that he immediately attached to Maimonides' halakhic code. Maimonides publishes his code, it comes out, and almost immediately this commentary by ibn Daoud appears with it, in which ibn Daoud says, that's wrong. That's what he says, that's wrong. <laughs> or if you leave, who could one ask to care for the parent? It's striking. And I would just say, it seems to me there are two possibilities for Ibn Daoud's uh, incredulous reaction. The first possibility would be that he lives in a place where that just doesn't you don't have agents that act on your behalf. There are no retirement homes. There are no nursing uh, facilities. And that Maimonides lived in cosmopolitan Cairo, and it was possible. That's one possibility. That Ibn Daoud is saying, I never heard of such an age. That doesn't make any sense to me. There is another possibility that implicit in is, that's wrong doesn't have to do with a resource absence, but if one leaves, who could one ask to care for one's parent <coughs> suggests that Ibn Daoud says we're talking about a certain quality of concern, and that is inherent in a parent-child relationship. I just don't know how you can call an agent comparable to what a child could provide. Either way, it's a striking example of two major figures saying, this is the halakha, and a contemporary saying, I don't think so. Let's think about this again. The last sources, before I turn things over to Nina, the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch was the most successful. Yes, please. Just on your point there, it yes. does shine a little bit of a light to me on why Jesus, in the, according to the Gospel of John, I believe, assigned responsibility for care of his mother uh -huh. to John. And it's not considered <laughs> neglect. Yeah. And it perhaps already reflects an establishment. But why was he doing that? I and mean, it may just be because of this tradition you're talking about. Yes, that it was legitimate because of the tradition, and perhaps suggests a certain tension, if not the, the practical need that I can't, I have to believe. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, the Shulchan Aruch was the um, most successful attempt to codify halakha. It was composed at the end of the 16th century by a Jew living in the Galilee, in a small Jewish community of Spanish Jewish refugees. The name of the halakha collection, Shulchan Aruch, comes from the 23rd Psalm, and it means set table. Shulchan is a table, Aruch is set. He sets a table 
before my enemies in the 23rd Psalm. Um, the, tape, the, the name itself became controversial immediately because people said halakha doesn't work that way. You can't set the table. You set out the precedence, but it has to remain flexible and oral enough so that it can meet any changing circumstance. But it was too late. Some people say too late <coughs> because of the printing press. <laughs> the technology that was coming into use at the time changed people's attitudes about the way halakha worked. At any rate, the Shulchan Aruch attempts to codify the preceding halakha and without going into any detail about that passage from the Shulchan Aruch, except to say that on the one hand, the halakha is sustained. In the second passage, there is nevertheless an agotic observation, but it's a terrible mistake for a parent to lean on children on the basis of halakhic responsibilities, that they can expect it, but wise parents don't demand it unless they really need that help. Followed by a commentary, a later commentary, called Aruch HaShulchan, which is the two words turned around. Shulchan Aruch means a set table. Aruch HaShulchan means something like table setting. The uh, material that you have in that third column attempts to draw together already uh, nearly two millennia of halachic development in ways that could be standardized across Jewish communities. And that experiment for the last 400 years is coming to a critical point in Jewish life now that perhaps we need to touch on in our closing conversation. With that, I'll turn to Nina. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm going to make sure that I turn this on so that I can be heard. Um, we know that this is an issue of the relationship of parents and children that brings up a lot, a lot of feelings and a lot of opinions in people. And we hope that you have had a chance to continue talking about them over the course of the week and that you will continue. Um, we wish that we could continue that piece of the conversation here today, but we really have a, a lot that we want to tell you. So um, please continue. Uh, but let's go on to today's dilemma, the next dilemma, which is about Margot Anderson. And as I told you last time, uh, we were teaching a class uh, of teenagers in St. Paul, and we call that class Family Money and Loose Talk. So we've done the family piece of it, a piece of uh, halakha regarding family relationships. This is a loose talk piece of it. This is one aspect of how we um, respectfully engage with one another in our conversation. Okay, Margo Anderson, and I'll read it. Feel free to do follow along. Margo Anderson is excited. This is a big night when her congregation is hosting a community-wide forum on climate change. Hundreds of people from neighboring congregations are in attendance. Margo, the youth director of the host congregation, has prepared her teens to be ushers for the event. And their stated responsibility is to help maintain a welcoming, safe, and orderly atmosphere. Margo's congregation, with the firmly articulated objective of their governing board to bring the entire community together in this initiative, has been very careful to have diverse perspectives represented. The third speaker at the forum, Dr. Niels Danberger, is undoubtedly the most controversial. A national speaker, seen by some as a pseudoscientist, he tours primarily among religious organizations promoting climate change skepticism. As the publicity from his sponsoring organization, the Center for the Study of Religion and Liberty, states, climate changes all the time, but not because of human activity. After the first two speakers have completed their initial remarks, the moderator, who is the president of the board of the congregation, introduces Dr. Danberger. 
Three minutes into his remarks, a moment after declaring, our youth have been seduced by liberal demons, a large banner is unfurled from the balcony emblazoned with yes to science. At the same time, perhaps six or eight teenagers, including several from Margot's own youth group, rise and begin to chant, yes to science, no more lies, action now. Yes to science, no more lies, action now. Many in the sanctuary are clearly upset by what is occurring. Cheers and boos break out around the room. But what now catches Margot's attention are the insistent gestures of the board president, indicating that she and her ushers either make the protesters sit down or escort them out. In the heat of the moment, Margot considers three possibilities. One, see to it that the interrupters sit down or are escorted out. Two, do nothing. Or three, declare that the interrupters should be allowed to proceed. So none of these might be exactly what you would do, but we're gonna ask you for the sake of just conversation now to please select the option that comes closest to what you think is the best possible response. And let's do it with a show of hands. This has to happen quickly. It is the heat of the moment. So what would you do? Who would do number one? See to it if you're Margot in charge of the usher. See to it the interrupters sit down or escort it out. Hands? Okay, good number. Who would do nothing? Anyone? We have some hands for doing nothing. And who would declare that the interrupters should be allowed to proceed? Ah, very interesting. Okay. So if, if we were doing this in a setting where we had a lot more time to discuss, we would ask you right away to talk to each other and explain why and justify your, your reasons. Um, we do expect to have some time for discussion and for second thoughts after we've introduced the sources, but we won't be able to do that now. Um, so with that, I'll, let, I'll turn it over to Earl, and he'll introduce the traditional sources that might um, shed some light on this dilemma. Maybe you'll do a little bit of changing of your minds, and we'll take it from there. We have two sets of sources for you in this case. The first set has to do with what is known traditionally in Jewish uh, literature as the commandment of tokacha, of reproof. The second has to do with the tradition of the responsibility of mikah, of protesting a wrong when you see it. So I'd like to very quickly go through the tokacha material first and then a little more carefully the second set of sources that I provided you. So the Tokapa material begins with the do not harbor hatred. As you can see, this comes from Leviticus 19. And in fact, the passage that we're going to focus on is in the series of clauses leading up to love of neighbor. It's an extraordinary text in and of itself. Those six or eight clauses immediately before love of neighbor are almost certainly intended to be considered as consciously juxtaposed to that culminating principle. Why these particular clauses, if we had time, I think is a very enriching discussion. But for now, we'll just look at the way in which the responsibility for reproof is nested among them. Don't harbor hatred against one of your kin, you must reprove your people and not bear guilt on the other's account. Don't seek revenge or hold a grudge against the members of your people, but love the next person as someone like yourself. I am the eternal. From that clause of reproof and consideration midrashically of the surrounding clauses, a very, very rich halakhic tradition emerged having to do with the duty, the responsibility that one person has for another when they see them acting improperly to let them know what they see. 
But of course, as you can see in the second column, once again, such a difficult responsibility, just like the responsibility for caring for one's parents, raises an agotic look. We know this is hard. So just very quickly, that opening passage from Midrash Sifra at the beginning of the second column, how do we know that even if you've reproved someone four or five times, you must nevertheless go on reproving from the fact that the text says you must. In the Hebrew, the verb is repeated two times in a row, which is taken as an intensification. You reprove, reprove, which we would translate, I think, properly as must. You must do this. But does that mean to the point of humiliating the person? The text says no, and not bear guilt on the other's account. So this Midrashic tradition says the juxtaposition of you must reprove, but not bear guilt, has to do with how you reprove. The guilt that you might, in fact, incur upon yourself has to do with how you do this. Rabbi Tar, rabbi from the end of the first beginning of the second century, said, I swear, no one around here knows how to do this. <laughs> Rabbi Eliezer says, a contemporary, no one of this generation knows how to take it. <laughs> Rabbi Akiva, the most prominent of the three, says, I swear, no one of this generation knows how to do it. Without uh, belaboring the point, it's clear that early rabbinic sources, like we saw last week, are quite sober about the nature of the responsibilities placed on individuals by the biblical halakhic tradition. If this isn't just uh, wise advice, if this isn't just broad uh, uh, directions for living a worthy life, but if you're in this circumstance, this is your responsibility, this is what you're expected to do, it's difficult. It's a difficult way to live one's life, and that's what that passage once again suggests. Without going into the uh, subsequent material, I would just suggest that the development of this tradition, that one is responsible for telling one's fellow if one sees that they're doing something improper, join to we understand it's difficult to do that well, to avoid humiliating the other person, to avoid triggering a reaction in which the behavior becomes even more adamant, to avoid taking the opportunity to lord it over them. There are all kinds of ways in which this can go wrong. The subsequent development of the halakha is richly laced with discussion of those implications. And instead, I'd like to go to the accompanying set of sources. If one is responsible for reproving, but one finds it impossible to do it well, is struck by the difficulty of carrying out that responsibility, there nevertheless is the corresponding tradition in Jewish sources that never really gets developed philosophically, but is clearly there, that if you see something outrageous going on, you got to say no. So you have on the one, you have on the one hand this highly nuanced tradition of you have to tell people if you see them behaving improperly in a way that has a chance of changing their behavior. And on the other hand, this broader tradition, uh, if there's outrageous behavior going on, you just have to say no. And the two are never fully reconciled a lot, except to say that they stand before Jewish tradition ever after as challenges to the kind of comfortable, I'm okay where I am, kind of attitude that often sets. So, very quickly, one would expect that the halakha defining this protest strain of the literature is captured in the line from the second, 22nd chapter of Exodus. 
You must not curse God or damn the chieftain of your people. Fair enough, okay. Behave yourself and talk nicely, especially with people in the world. I've been provided with three biblical narratives. They're not halakha. They're not normative legal passages. They're story narratives that seem to fly in the face of that halakhic standard. And in one case, clearly, literally, challenging the halakha in the narrative itself. I've given you the three to give you a sense of how biblical tradition itself is so complex and laced with uh, opposing perspectives. The, the passage from Exodus seems clear enough. You talk, talk respectfully to people in authority. These three stories are stories in which the heroes don't. And on the contrary, speak outrageously to people in authority and seem to be the hero of the story. In the first case, I'll just summarize. David is fleeing Jerusalem after uh, being tossed out by his son Absalom. And along the way, a member of the family of Benjamin finds David on the route out of Jerusalem. And this man, whose name was Shehi, the son of Gera, comes out cursing and throwing stones at David and all of King David's retinue and all the crowd and all the warriors on his right and left and he's cursing and saying, go away, go away, you bloody scoundrel. This is the king. This guy comes out throwing rocks at him and saying, get out of here. And in the passage, David says, when people say, why don't I go over and just cut that man's head off? <laughs> David says, you know, he may well be right. In the second passage, the story of Elijah the prophet, who when he hears that a man named Nabot has been put to death, um, contrived false testimony so that Ahab can uh, <coughs> seize Nabot's land, Elijah meets Ahab at the land that Ahab has come to inspect, and Elijah says to Ahab, I found you since you sold out to evil in God's eyes. Look, I'm going to bring evil upon you. I'm going to hunt you down. I'm going to put an end to any wall pisser issuing from Ahab. <laughs> what? <laughs> this is oh, that's good. That is a crude term, apparently a common crudity <coughs> in biblical Israel for males. Oh. Somebody who urinates horizontally. <laughs> but, the, the, yes. but the, the text quotes Elijah the prophet saying this to the king. Oh, by the way, in King James, it's uh, pisseth on a wall. So, outrageous. <laughs> 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 And Elijah's clearly the hero of the story. Finally, Amos and Amatsia in the seventh chapter of the book of Amos, prophecy is interrupted by a short narrative in which the priest of the sanctuary of Bethel confronts Amos, who is apparently uh, making a speech against the king, and says, why don't you get out of here? This is, this is the capital. This is the king's sanctuary. Go home. Go home and talk like this. To which, although I haven't given you the quote, Amos replies in equally provocative language about what's about to happen to the kid. Crude and direct. Once again, the hero of the story seems to be the person who violates rather than observes the principle stated in Exodus 22. The subsequent uh, columns elaborate on the responsibility. Uh, in the second column, I'll just note that there is this Talmudic tradition that whatever the difficulties involved in speaking out and at the same time observing the principles having to do with rebuking in a way that really works and doesn't humiliate, you've got to do it that this standing responsibility is necessarily going to often collide with 
And the quality of how you do it matters. You must do it, and how you do it makes a great difference. I'll just say, uh, just because it's kind of charming, in the middle of that column, I have two versions of what appears to be the same story, that King Alexander uh, Janus, who was a king of um, the uh, Hasmonean uh, monarchy at the end of its um, uh, dynasty, uh, was uh, had become so unpopular, this would be about two generations before Jesus, that when he appeared in public for the celebration of tabernacles, the people who had gathered there when he appeared to do something outrageous simply to, to provoke a response, they were holding citrons, which have to do with the celebration of the, the festival. They started throwing them at the king. This is in the temple, and they're throwing their citrons at the king. That appears in Josephus and Talmud suggests this really happened. Wow. I, I will only briefly say in the third column, Isaac of Arbonnel, who had his <coughs> taste of the high life as a representative of the Spanish Jewish community to the crown, both in Spain and then in Portugal. So he knew what politics was all about until uh, the Jews were expelled, expelled from both <coughs> locations. Uh, Abarbanel, reflecting on the story of uh, Shimi ben Guerra, who uh, lambasts David in the way that we just described, said, there's a weighty lesson to be learned here. That when a person sees one of the adversaries one is facing, that one isn't going to be able to put up a fight against those stronger and more intrepid. One can <coughs> turn one's power on the smallest and the weakest of them. Barbanel is speaking of David's response. David's getting uh, booed. He's getting dissed by this crazy man who's come out, uh, has this family feud, is throwing rocks at the king, one of David's guards says, I'm just going to go over and sever his head. <laughs> and David says, you know he may be right. David's teaching us an important lesson, which is, David had every reason to cut somebody's head off. And the fact that he couldn't actually cut off the heads of those who were tormenting him doesn't give him permission to do it to somebody who's in his reach. It's a wonderful, wonderful thoughtful observation. David's teaching us an important lesson. If you're angry, if you're resentful, if you got an issue, make sure that you're not taking it out on someone who's conveniently available to you. Make sure you're properly locating where that ire should be spent. Yes? Don't go home and kick the cat. Exactly, exactly. Which David's retinue is tempting him to do. Okay. And finally, later sources, which all lead to a 20th century question in Solomon Freehouse Modern Reform Response, in which uh, we're told that uh, sometime, I believe, around the mid-1960s, President Hesburg of Notre Dame was invited to speak at a synagogue. He had indicated previously that the college would, the university would now follow a policy of a strict limitation of protest at the university, especially sit-ins. And there are members of the community where this synagogue that has invited Father Hesper to speak have decided we can't tolerate that suppression of free speech. If he comes to the synagogue for service, we will disrupt service. fact is that in medieval Jewish sources, there's a record of a tradition that under certain circumstances, if you have a legal dispute that the um, other party refused to respond to, you have a right to go into the synagogue, stop services, and say, I demand that that other person meet me. So on the basis of that halakha, or at least deeply rooted tradition, Solomon Freehaw, a reformed Jewish rabbi, was asked, in the case of uh, Father Hesper, 
are those Jews who would disrupt the service because they have a serious issue with Father Hesper actually observing a traditional practice. Those are the sources, once again, as I said, only, only an indication of a far broader range of material. And uh, with that, I would quickly ask uh, any thoughts about Yes, please. Um, I didn't mean to interrupt your question, but I, is there a distinction between a religious service and what was happening in Margot's congregation, which was a lecture series, it yes. looks like? And yes. would, would there be a difference? Because it looks like in your medieval sources, the time of day of the service mattered, yes. and you could only interrupt some if you'd already tried to interrupt the evening ones three times and the guy didn't listen. Yes. Then you can break into any service. But yes, it looks like, thank you, it looks like this was a custom that was out of control. So by the time it gets to halakha, most of the halakha says, well, you can only do it in this circumstance. You can only do it if you've been thoroughly frustrated up until this point. You can only do it at certain points in the service during certain points of the day. Clearly a concern that it could be abused. If this is a lecture, is that an entirely different circumstance? Yes. Yes, please. It just seems to me that the person who is really ethically challenged here is the president of the congregation who expects one of his underlings to restore order when he's the one that invited the person. <laughs> and his board is the one that set the policy and if anyone should stand up and create order it should be he or she I assume to be you know and that that's where the responsibility was Ignored. If you put the two, two types of sources together, the reproof source and the protest source, you might get something like, Margo walks up to the president of the board and says, I think you have a certain response. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, too, that this struck me when you started this, that, that started talking through the, the two sides that you just mentioned, the reproof side and the protest side. And in this scenario, it would be very revealing to to hear people say or to, to know where people were coming from if they defined who was on the reproof side and who was on the, the protest side. Absolutely. Because it's, that would define who you think is wrong. If you think the speaker was wrong in their opinion about climate change, and the teenagers were the pro the properly protesting what they saw as a wrong, or do you see the teenagers as being wrong and the ones in need of reproof? Nina has a, uh, a couple of really fertile what ifs. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question to bring up. So. You could ask, I can give you an example of when this happened, how this has played out in the Jewish community some years ago, maybe 20 years ago. Maybe some of you remember there was a big issue about the slaughtering plant in Coastville, Iowa. So um, there was a movement uh, that started in the Twin Cities, actually in our congregation with our rabbi, uh, Rabbi Morris Allen, who, um, to say the, the slaughtering plant was a kosher slaughtering plant and it met all of the technical definitions of how you slaughter an animal so that its meat is technically kosher for the, for the next stages in the, in the um, stage of the animal getting to market. And in the process of that, um, it came to light that, they, that the meat might have been slaughtered technically kosher, but the people who were slaughtering it, the people who were working in the plant, were not being treated respectfully. The working conditions were abysmal. Uh, they were being taken advantage of in numerous ways. And uh, we began to ask the question, is, is the process of... of, of defining what is kosher. Is it limited to the technicalities or does it include an ethical consideration as well? And should it cons include an ethical consideration? And so that was the start of a movement um, to 
broaden the definition of kashmir, what is considered kosher, to include an ethical dimension. Hmm. Now, it became a social movement, a political movement, there were protests, there was a lot of public outcry about it, and it led to extreme results. Uh, the, the owner of the company was actually in prison, and he was an Orthodox Jew. So the question arose, um, depending on the perspective that you took, where, who, who needed reproof here? Um, had it been done appropriately, and there was a, a second side that, that went online and social media and attacked, 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 attacked Rabbi Allen for the way that he had gone about it. Not necessarily for what he did, but the way that he had gone about it publicly. So you had public reproof a very public, vicious attack on that reproof. All sides thinking that they were doing the right thing, a lot of it. So that's kind of how it has played out, an example of how it's played out in our community. Okay. I'm just going to quickly tell you a bit more about the origins of this dilemma. Then, uh, a word about the beginning of a third. And finally, Nina will be this in our closing conversation. So, first, as you can see, there's a very rich tradition in Jewish sources surrounding the issues raised by this story as well. In fact, the origin of this dilemma, as we teach it, is interesting, I think, in and of itself. About uh, 40 years ago now, I was invited to develop some curriculum materials for the Jewish school that I was teaching at. And these were going to be dilemma-based materials. And for the subject matter that we've been studying this morning, my first thought was Jesus in the temple. Jesus is overturning of the tables, is clearly aggressive and provocative behavior, and that that would be the narrative around which we would study the sources having to do with reproof and protest. My principal, who was supervising the project, said that using Jesus in the temple would just prove too distracting for Jewish <coughs> study sessions. And so he suggested instead the Amos and Amatia material. He said it is somewhat comparable, but that last source in the protest column that you saw, the prophet Amos challenging the priest Amatia, would be the dilemma. However, <coughs> in the material that I composed, it was about a synagogue service synagogue service in which when on Yom Kippur, the most solemn day of the Jewish year, the prophetic reading gets to the passage, is this the uh, fast that I've chosen from Isaiah? Isn't it to deal your bread to the poor? Isn't it to not hide yourselves from those who need you in your community? When that line comes up in Isaiah, Somebody jumps up in the congregation and says, no more singing, no more praying. We've got to listen to the prophet. And there's a hubbub in the synagogue, and, and the rabbi steps forward and says, would the ushers please maintain order? But that story, in turn, was based on a real story. And that was during the Cambodian crisis of the early 70s, when word reached the United States, there was mass starvation going on among Cambodians displaced by endless war. At a Friday night service at the Temple of Aaron in St. Paul, the rabbi, Rabbi Raskus, came forward in the service and said, we can't, we can't let this happen. What are we praying for? We've got to do something. And 
That night, two physicians of the congregation made plans to leave for Cambodia and were gone by Sunday. Which leads to the question, does it make a difference if the rabbi interrupted the service? Is that what it significant? Not someone jumping up from the top of the But anyway, we hope once again that the process of looking through the sources in this way has proved valuable. The, the, the subject that we were going to begin, but I think I'll leave it for another time, and instead turn to me, that is, of abortion. The third passage in the outline, as you'll see, regarding what we were going to study is, what is a nephesh? Nephesh is the Hebrew word commonly used throughout the Hebrew Bible and translated as soul, person, people. But in abortion texts, it has a technical definition, beginning with the passage in Exodus 21 and 22, in which we're told, if a woman is caught in a brawl, someone strikes her, she uh, has a spontaneous abortion, the only actionable offense in that case is a civil suit against the person who struck the woman. If, however, the woman dies, and it's a criminal offense. Nefesh tachat nefesh. A nefesh for a nefesh. It's clear that that first passage does not describe the fetus <coughs> as having nefesh. And the subsequent development of the Shalakara circulates around what is a nefesh. Mm -hmm. Okay, with that, we turn to you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, everyone. Well, hopefully leaving you um, ready to think a lot more about all of these issues. I, um, there's a little frustration that Earl and I feel that we wish we could do more. Um, but you can, yourselves, certainly, in taking these to the next step. But let me ask you, as, as we get ready to close, um, are there particular sources that we've looked at in the, today or last Sunday that have surprised you or had a particularly strong impact on you? This is personal opinion only. Yes. Well, I, I can't say that the, I, mean, I don't know these resources as well, and I know a few of them, but and, and what struck me about him was the seriousness with which things get taken, and the openness of the kinds of conversations, the willingness to reprove another scholar because he got something wrong, and then coming back and then having defense and that. I mean, that open um, verbal and intellectual battling, I find really, really attractive. Um, I think a living, it, it demonstrates a living tradition, which is um, it, it is just absolutely critical to both of our traditions, I think. I think you raise a really wonderful point. One might think that to ask a, a halakhic question, you just get the answer. And in fact, what you do get is this living tradition with all of the hands that we've been talking about, this hand and that hand. Yes. I was struck last week and now this week again. When I teach confirmation to our young people, one of the things when we talk about the ethical Christian life that I say really early on is, if you care what God thinks, I've got a lot to talk to you about. If you don't, there's no point in any of this conversation. And what I love about what we've seen these two weeks is, this is how you care for what God thinks. I mean, this, this conversation is all about, it actually matters what is the faithful response here and because i'm i think sometimes in modern christianity we've gotten to a point where oh well whatever do whatever you want to do and to me that the care for well what what would be the right thing to do here 
Um, that's a fruitful conversation, but only if it matters to you that you might try to do the right thing. Other than that, it's it's sort of a wasted, a wasted talk. So I, I appreciate the sort of the intensity of the desire to try to get this as close to what we think would be the appropriate, the godly response. Thank you. Thank you. It's interesting to hear it certainly from your perspective as a pastor, and I can say that Jews have had to to, to grapple with this. Um, especially the obligatory nature of the sources, which has been very difficult. It's difficult for all of us, um, even if we do care, and we start from caring mightily, um, to, to take that care and these difficult uh, challenges. And we might say, I care so much about this issue, so intensely and so personally, that I have to be the one who makes the decision. And that's from the perspective of, of rights, right? It's got to be my choice. How could I trust anybody else? And on the other hand, to say, I care so mightily about this that it mustn't be just my decision. I must consult others, others that I trust, others that I have a relationship with. And sometimes, it's even the right thing for me to take their response, to take their answer, and, and to trust that and to say, OK, you've done the thinking. You've done it in an intense way, in a way that listens to all perspectives. I need to trust that. And that's the language of obligation. So we, we, we're we all challenged by that as modern people. Um, and modernity has greatly intensified that struggle. Um, if, if you come up um, as an um, Orthodox Jew, orthodoxy has become increasingly reactionary and has said, well, the answers are there. We don't look, we don't, it's, it's not as living as it once was. Other Jews are happy at most to consult the halachic process and to give it a vote, not a veto, as they say. Hmm. Um, but there's, so there's all those hands there. We've been struggling with hands since we started. The one hand of, the, the two hands of the competing values, the two hands of my opinion and your opinion, the raised hands, three hands, five hands, um, the hands of the process, which is has been a, on this hand and a, on the other hand. We've seen the sources also compete with each other. We need to conclude, and what we would like to do is conclude by bringing all of those hands together and thanking you. <laughs>